guys, welcome back to Magic TV. My name's Craig. It is nine o'clock on a Saturday, which means it's time for a talk magic. And today I'm very, very excited. I am speaking today to two people, two people who I, I think it's fair to say that at the moment they are the top double act in the UK. And I know that's a big claim. And I know there's a lot of double acts out there, but having seen a lot of the double acts that there are in the magic community, uh, I think these guys are the best. They're hilarious. They're funny. They work really well together. They are now having, they've spent a long time working for real people. But over the course of the last year, we're seeing them pop up in the magic community a lot more. So this is the perfect time to chat to them. Two very talented, very nice people um, who are just, I'm so excited to speak to them. I am, of course, talking to the one and only Nathan Jones and Steve Griffin, who together, are Griffin and Jones. How you doing, guys? Doing Hello. Really good. Really good. I've got to say, I was a little bit worried that you were introducing Morgan and West there. Uh, <laughs> I, thought, I thought, oh no, it's happened again. Not again. They've, they've had their day. <laughs> yeah. I, like, we are, we're big Morgan and West fans. We love them. Oh, yeah. They're very good. So very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I've had Morgan and West on this channel and uh, they're, they're wonderful. They really are. They're a fantastic double act. Um, very different to you guys, though. Very, very different in so many different ways. Yeah. I think and so, yeah. One, I really enjoyed interviewing Morgan and West. It's the same reason I'm going to really enjoy interviewing you because you guys approach things very, very differently. When you're a double act, yeah. especially the way that you guys do it, your approach to magic and your approach to creating an act and the approach to the business side and everything is very different than if you kind of went in there and did it as a as a solo. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we, I think what we. I think one of the benefits of being a double act in terms of actually constructing the act is it forces you to make more decisions and also forces you to properly script a routine. Whereas if you get a trick as a solo act, you can just go out there and perform it and see what happens. When you're a double act, you can't do that because you'll end up talking over each other and interrupting each other. So you really need to sit down and script and work out a routine. So it's just, it's a bit of a shorter process. That was one of the first conversations that we had, really, wasn't it? When we mm. started working together, it was, you know, how are we going to make this dynamic work? And yes, we just we have to script everything. You have yeah. to, you know. And I want to talk all about this when we get to that point, because it's kind of interesting, because I've spoken to you several times off stage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And speaking to you when you're not on stage, it feels like I'm speaking to a double act, in that <laughs> even when I'm speaking to you and you're not scripted, you're not tripping over each other's lines. You're not interrupting each other. You kind of instinctively know when one person's going to finish and the next person's going to start. And that's yeah. not scripted because we're talking about stuff that you couldn't. Yeah. Well, I, again, I think to a, to a certain not. extent. Yeah. Oh, sorry. You, I think you cut uh, off a little bit. There. No, no, no. I, no, I, no, I, think, I think we lost yeah. you for a moment there. Uh, um, but yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, it's, I mean, a huge amount of that is just the amount of time we've spent together over the mm. last sort of 14, 15 years, however long we've known each other, it's got to be something like that now. Yeah, we've been working together for just over 10. Yeah. Like eight, if we're, if we're counting proper years. Uh, for some, but sort of uh, 12, if we're counting the very early gigs. Yeah. You know, it's, there's um, there's, there's but, a bit of a no man's land in there. But what? But basically, it's because we we write how we speak, and so we know each other's speech patterns. So pe people often think, like people often say to us, oh, were you ever off? I'm like, like well, we're sort of this is just how we interact with each other all the time um so it's not as if we're constantly being like oh mr showbiz like we're not doing that now obviously it's a little different because we're on zoom but it's not as if we're we're not on griffin and jones we're just chatting yeah yeah we, we do the same thing when it's just us talking yeah you know like you say we we sort of we know each other's not only do we know each other's kind of rhythms and pacing of how we speak but we've sort of developed a bit of a kind of a mutual rhythm mm -hmm. and pacing to how we speak. You know, we sort of, we, 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 we both, especially when we're together, tend to work to a certain sort of beat and yeah, it's, it's irritating. It's, it's become, become, it's oh really yeah, no, irritating. it's massively irritating. <laughs> but it, it's become quite instinctive, I think at this point. And, and I want to delve into all of this because one of the, I, I mentioned to you when we were with each other last week, one of the, um, one of the questions I get on this channel a lot is, hey, I want to do a double act. How can I do that? So I'm going to pick your brain. There's a certain, some things that uh, you like about double act, some things that you've got pet hate. We talked about that as well. I want to get into all of that. But before we do, 
I want to kind of go into your origin story because <laughs> you guys didn't like appear out of the womb like holding each hand. Right, here we go. There was obviously a period of time where both of you were getting into magic and somehow you then found each other and decided to go on this path together. Can we talk about your two origin stories and how you got into magic and how you ultimately kind of hooked up as, as a double up? Would that be okay? Yeah, of course. I mean, I was, I was into magic uh, before Nath was, um, mm -hmm. I mean, partly just by nature of the fact I'm older, uh, but also um... significantly. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. Like... <laughs> <laughs> Let's keep it civil now, Nath. You know, people are going to see this. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm a few years older than Nath. Um, I, I sort of, I, I, magic's one of those things that always fascinated me from when I was a little kid. You know, even before I really necessarily knew what a magician did. You know, I'd seen some, uh, you know, at birthday parties and stuff, as many of us have done when we're small. Uh, but it wasn't really until sort of my teenage years that I started getting more interested in it. Uh, there was a little, uh, in Guildford, there used to be a little independent bookshop at the top of the high street, Thorpe's Bookshop. Um, and I just remember I went in there after school one day and was just looking, I've always preferred non-fiction to fiction books. And I was just looking in like the hobbies section, as many of us have done over the years. Um, and there was a magic book in there. I think it was Royal Road. I think it was Royal Road to Card Magic. Um, so we're going back away now. But anyway, um, I bought it. And uh, the following week, I went in there and there were two magic books. Um, and so because it was this nice little independent bookshop, clearly the, you know, the proprietor had gone, oh, someone's bought this. Let's see if we can, you know, uh, tempt some more money out of them. So literally, I used to sort of not spend my lunch money at school. Instead, I'd save it up. And then when I could, I'd go into the bookshop and just buy up whatever, you know, it was all the sort of, um, you know, Royal Road, Bobo's, all like the Dover sort of public domain mm -hmm. um, um, book, uh, magic books that, that you could get. Um, and that was that. I never performed it, really. It was just just a hobby, just an interest. Yeah, um, I mean, we, we met through performing, but we were so we were members of a uh, our local theatre group. Um, who used to put on, we used to put on like two big shows a year, one in, one in the local theatre, and then one at, uh, we've got, a, uh, we've got a castle, so we used to do it in the castle grounds, it was usually Shakespeare or something like that. Yeah. Um, so we were both just local actors and we met in a little theatre group and how we actually came together, and this is actually my entire origin story in magic, um, is, so as a, like, I always liked magic, always, like I was, I was, I was the kid that loved magic, I would record everything that was on TV, I was just at the age, I was like sort of 10 or 11 when the whole Blaine, Darren Brown thing exploded. So that was right up my alley. But I never knew how to do a single trick. Didn't know a key card trick, nothing. Um, because I'm fat handed. I'm incredibly fat handed. I can't, I, like Doing magic is not an option for me. Um, <laughs> but I had learnt, I used to smoke at the time, I'd learnt cigarette vanish. Just the, the simple, you know, you lick, you lick your, um, you know, the, the, the lick, that one whatever it's called, I don't oh, even know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, that one. And um, I was stood outside the rehearsal room for, we were rehearsing for Animal Farm. And um, and I was smoking and doing that for people just as a joke, badly. And Steve said to me, and we were already mates at this point just through doing acting, Steve said, I've got a little bit of a magic library at home. Um, there's a guy that does cigarette stuff. Do you want me to give you a DVD on it? And I was like, oh, I know, I love magic. I'd love to watch it. And Steve lent me the um, the Tom Mullica Greater Magic Video Library DVD. Great DVD, great DVD. Absolute classic, stone cold classic. And honestly, and I've, I've said I've said this to people before. Whenever anyone asks me, like sort of how we got into it, honestly, I watched that DVD and it completely changed my life. Like it sounds so stupid, but I really mean it because I never, I didn't know you could be that funny and do good magic. I didn't yeah, know you're magic. Talking be... about Tom Mullica, uh, you're talking about uh, Tom Tom Tom, Tom Mullica, um, yeah, Tom yeah. Mullica here, who was one of the greatest comedy yeah. magicians. Oh, without time. question, huge He's our influence hero. on us. I mean, you've you've got the poster on on your wall behind. Oh that, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. This this is my my friend painted a, a Tom Mullica um, uh, canvas for me, which sits on my office wall. Um, wow. But we, like, and so I I watched it, and it was just this man being outrageously funny and doing this amazing magic. And then he taught it. And I was 
I was I, like, I was blown away. So I sat there with a with a horrible Waddington's deck of cards at age. I was about nineteen at this point, um, learning just how to control a card. And the moment I learned how to control a card, my mind goes starts sort of firing off, and I'd come up with five different ways of revealing said controlled card and all this stuff. Um, and yeah, and then and then Steve just started giving me more DVDs, and I was performing stand up comedy at that point, which I was getting increasingly bored of and not enjoying um so I, so i wanted it like a new outlet and that was our kind of we were like maybe we should just put together 10 minutes as a joke just sort of see how it goes put together a 10 minute routine um, yeah because we, we went up to edinburgh fringe didn't we with the theater company not to mm -hmm. perform just up as punters as a kind of group thing we were up there for i don't know best part of a week it it, it felt yeah like, it was it was um, a solid week yeah and you know that that was back when at Edinburgh Fringe you could afford to go to like five shows a day for a week, and you know when it was like five pound a, a ticket or what have you. God, that scene's changed, doesn't it? <laughs> but anyway, um, we sort of we chatted about it, and we were both like, "Well, there's you know like Pete Furman's up there, and you know there, there were a few magic shows up there." We saw so we Morgan West and... the first year we went up. That was it. Yeah, that was it. Of course, that was the first time we saw Morgan and West. Yeah. yeah. So we went up and we saw some magic, and we kind of went. I I think we could do this. Um, and it, but it was never supposed to be a real thing, I don't think. We just... No, it, 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 it was a laugh. It was it was something to do, you know, th that would fizzle out before we did the next play or whatever. You know, yeah. it was just, uh, let's let's give it a shot just so we can say we've done it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so we just, we wrote 10 minutes in, like, 2011. God, was it really 10? I didn't yeah. think we had that much at the start. It was well, because it was geek. It was the, all the geek routines, yeah. and then that one, that one card trick. Um, oh, that then evolved. Yeah. 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 Um, and we so we we did, we had ten minutes for about two years. Yeah. So I've got, I've got questions before we carry on with the uh, yeah 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 story. So, so first question is: You guys were obviously interested in performing. You met in a theatre yeah. company. Were you both? You 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 talked about actors. Were you both full time actors? Were you no. both? It was so, just, but, uh, it, it was amateur yeah. theatre. It so, was... So you had jobs. You weren't doing this full-time. Yeah. No, no, was no. The we goal, had... Was the goal to be a full-time performer? Was that the aspiration? Or was it just, hey, I love performing. I'm in this theatre company. I like hanging around with like-minded people. But mm -hmm. that's all it was. And it wasn't really anything I beyond think, I, I think both of us didn't know what we wanted to do. But I think, I think even before we met, if you just said snappy thing that become a full-time performer of some description we both would have taken that opportunity oh yeah 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 I'd, I'd, I'd to be fair I'd, I'd always wanted to be an actor um but it was kind of at a time that I was starting to realize that it's it's not easy you know uh like I've been to sort of drama class you know outside of school drama classes since I was eight years old you know I've, I've been on a stage for as long as I can well longer than I can remember I've got a terrible memory um <laughs> But yeah, you by that panto. point, you were in the panto. Remember, tell, sorry, tell what? Them, you were in that panto. Oh yeah, yeah, that was when I was ten. Yeah, yeah, I was. With I was Brian in Blessed and Toy my, Wilcox. My first professional show when I was ten years old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and that was it for about twenty years. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, so you know, I was sort of, I was at a point there where I, 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 sort of decided that I probably wasn't going to be a professional actor. So I think having the opportunity to pursue a different form of performance that was maybe just a different avenue, perhaps a bit more accessible, uh, was incredibly appealing. Mm. And I, again, what it was, was originally, it was definitely a kind of, I said, I don't want to do stand-up comedy anymore, but I think if we put together a funny 10-minute magic act, we can still work in comedy clubs and so yeah. that was the plan. Originally, that was our plan. We were like, we'll work that, comedy clubs. That was the only place that we knew that we'd be able to work. We had no mm. idea that the cabaret circuit existed. I mean, I don't know how big it was at that point. It sort of exploded a few years later, really, didn't no, it? No, it ex exploded when we started, really. We, mm. we largely got in while the going was good, I think. Yeah, on, on the upswing, certainly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think so. Wow. So... Was uh, so this is really fascinating. So when you guys decided to put this ten minutes together, yeah, you were obviously already performing. You were going, you know, you're in this uh, in this theatre company, and you said, "Hey, we had that ten minutes for two years." Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, well, you do, like a ten minute act isn't really enough for a lot of comedy clubs. So it is if you're doing like maybe a variety night, but like what were you doing during those two well, the years? Thing is, owning so, that ten minutes, like where were you? What were you so, doing during that two year period when you initially put that? I mean, act? gigs were very sporadic up to yeah. yeah. Literally, we started off. Um, our first couple of gigs really were like open mic nights in pubs mm -hmm. where they were expecting musicians, but we just wanted stage time. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Um, so we I would do any open mic that we happen. didn't go down very well because the audience wanted musicians as well. They weren't expecting magicians. Um, but then, yeah, you know, like it, it helped that we had a friend who ran uh, a comedy night in Guildford. And so we sort of we we schmoozed him into giving us uh, one of our first gigs. Um, but I basically, was, we, you oh, know, God. I sort of say we had that 10, mi 10 minutes. That was our kind of go to 10 minutes. Because for the first couple of years, we would do, we would only do, yeah, it, it, they were very sporadic. It was a couple of o years. open spots. Yeah, yeah, really? yeah. Was, and was... open and open spots is only ten minutes. Um, we weren't looking for money. We were just doing, you know, we would we would you know travel. I remember uh, we we got into the habit of going down to Bournemouth lots. For some reason, we, one of our first gigs we did was in Bournemouth, and then they kept booking us to do more. So we would travel for two hours there, two hours back to do ten minutes for no money, uh, and we were happy because um, it was a hobby um, and then but we were we were writing other material so we you know we had we had the 10 minutes and we were writing other material the thing that really really I would say started us going oh we could have a show here was we started running um, so we were with a local theatre company and then uh, then the two of us and two other friends started a small independent theatre company um, in Guildford of our own and decided to run cabaret and variety nights mm. um, and then but that was basically because we went well we're magicians so that's variety and cabaret we had uh, the other uh, the other two people we started the company with were both girls and they were like well, we can sing and pop on a corset so we'll call that cabaret you know uh, but what the idea was the idea was we were like well what that means is all the acts that we're not good enough to be on the same show as we can just pay them to do our show, and then we can work with them. Um, and then, uh, but what that meant was we were then running by about 2013. So yeah, we'd done two years of just doing all over mic spots, but 2013, we were running monthly uh, cabaret shows um, in our hometown where we would have four different variety acts come onto the show every month. But what that meant was we had to do new tricks every month. So we had to do a new 10 minutes every single month. Yeah. Um, so by that point, we were just banging out material. We were just absolutely throwing anything at the wall and getting it on stage. Well, yeah, whatever we thought might be viable, we write it up into a routine, throw it at a stage, and if it was if it went down well, we'd keep it and refine it. If it didn't, we'd burn it and pretend it never happened. You know, and, and because it was our own gig. It didn't. It, it sort of didn't really matter because we were like, no, not in the same way. Because we knew that we had proper acts coming in to impress the audience after us. You know, we were we were just opening the show with this stuff, and because people were coming on and it was our show, it it gave us quite a lot of, um, I guess, forgiveness uh, yeah. from the audience in that respect. Because um, yeah, we just felt like the kind of oh, they're just the local boys that have got up, um, so whatever they do will be okay. But we're here for the real acts. But it just meant we could just bang out loads of material and get better. Yeah. That's amazing. So I, I have other questions. Um, d d just reverse slightly. I want to go into where you were at that point there in a second. But one question that's just occurred to me. You started working with each other and you had this 10 minute act and you were going out and you were performing and you were getting flight time. Like you said, the most important thing was to get flight time. Mm -hmm. gotcha. um, but I imagine you were still doing a full time job at that point. But yes. you both wanted to be performers. Yeah. Did at any point it cross your mind where you go? going out and doing this 10 minutes and you're like you know what this is really good i'm going to start to try and get close at work on my own because that's what a lot of double acts do a lot of double acts they start the double act and they, then they're like oh somebody wants a close-up magician but they only want one i'll go and do it i speak from experience because that's what happened with me oh mm -hmm. but, you know then the other guy and before you know it the double act isn't going out all the time they're going out and doing close-up because they want to get that money and and do you know what I mean? It's like, did, yeah. you ever, did you ever get to a point where you're like, you know what? I love performing. This is going to give me an opportunity to embrace other aspects of magic that might paint more. Yeah. Because at no point have you said anything other than stage magic working together. 
Yeah. Mm. Which is kind of really interesting. Most people that I've ever spoken to that do double acts, they've had like a stage on their own have come together. So it's yeah. really interesting that you've come at this from a completely different way. So I think we have. I think for most people, close up magic is the accessible way into magic, isn't it? Because all you need is a coin or a deck of cards and you can entertain your mates down the pub and then you're entertaining the people at the bar and then you know and then you're going oh i could do this for money or someone says hey come and do my birthday party or what or, you know what will my work do or whatever um neither of us were ever like that like neither of us particularly performed socially neither of us particularly enjoy i mean nice better at it than me but neither of us particularly enjoy like close-up gigs not yeah not traditional strolling no That's like we've both really done it you know generally you know we in our early days yeah you know we did a couple of weddings and stuff like that people would say oh you're magicians could you come and do our wedding or whatever and we was always together yes was always oh together. Yeah, yeah 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 it was yeah pretty much always together yeah um and we'd say yes because that's what we thought you did and because like you say that's an opportunity to make some money because the mm -hmm. stuff that we were doing on stage was never about the money you know when we got our first 20 quid paycheck that was mm. you know that that was well it all went over the well, bar but you know that was a momentous uh occasion for us i do actually remember do you like do you remember the first paying gig because i don't i've got a whip like oh god yeah nath, nath carries the memory here i don't have one so um, yeah, go on. what was it but i rem i do remember our first paying gig and it was um do you remember it was my mate vic's wedding yeah oh yeah 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 i remember that one yeah um but I said, it was sort of a friend of a friend that i had from college years back um, and he said, he'd seen that we'd done this stage magic stuff and just said, oh, do you perform at weddings? And I messaged back all the time. Um, <laughs> like we had weekend. never done a close up gig up to no, that point. No. Um, so, yeah, the first first wedding we did, I remember he was like, how much? And I was like, I've no, I've no, I've no idea. And so we bashed our heads together and then we were like i remember we, we phoned a local magician I know. <laughs> like we with, a, with, with, a, with a pretend inquiry with a kind of um you know how much would you charge to come and perform at our wedding um i can't remember us. what he, it was a few I hundred do. quid he quoted and we went no that's ridiculous 400 pounds that's insane no one's ever gonna pay that for a wedding and so we so i went back to my friend and was like is a hundred too much? <laughs> and he was like, no, that's fine. So we did, yeah, in 20, about 2012, we did our first paying gig at a wedding for a hundred pounds. And we and I think it. it's fair to say he got at least 80 pound of value out of that. So He really did. Yeah, yeah he, he got his money's worth. Um, but, <laughs> but I remember he was thrilled. And I remember oh, yeah. saying, I remember, I remember saying, oh my God, we're sort of, we're technically semi-professional magicians. Yeah, I remember that conversation in the car on the way back. Yeah. We, we had our, our our first little wad of cash in our hands. Yeah, well, not really a wad, more of a flutter, but yeah. Yeah, um, <laughs> but yeah, so close-up magic has never been, like, don't worry, close-up magic is fun. Like, and for us, if we, like, I think we would have interest in putting on a close-up magic show, you know, something around ah, the formal close-up is very yeah. different. Yeah. Um, but the but strolling magic is not something that, you know, because we're from stage backgrounds, you know, like, again, I, I did stand-up comedy and we were both actors and we've both done bits and pieces of other things on the stage. It was always the kind of, no, nope, they all sit in seats facing the right way. I stand up and have a mic. That's, mm -hmm. that's, that's what we're interested in. And the other question is, before we get back to um, the timeline of how you guys got together, as you were doing, you were, you were, you know, we got to the point where you're running these events and you've got other people coming in and it's giving you a lot of flight time and you're creating new material and developing new material. Have you kind of, I don't want to say turned your back because that's not the right terminology, but have you kind of uh, changed your focus from a performing point of view away from musical theater or or what you know your theater company whatever that you were doing with that to magic because i've got a friend who does well his name's matt and he does uh musical theater and he's now doing magic and he's done he's doing magic full time yeah uh, pretty much and he just doesn't have any time to do anything with musical theater anymore i think uh, that was the thing it, it was quite an organic switch over but for precisely that reason you know it, it's it's the same it's the same thing really as the whole you know i'm a semi-professional when do i give up my day job when you don't have time for it anymore and i think it was the same with theater for us you know we were doing both uh for a while but 
we both found ourselves prioritizing the magic because we were having so much fun doing it. And, you know, both of us, you know, if you, if you'd said to either of us, when we were little kids, you're going to be a magician when you grow up, we'd have absolutely wet ourselves. You know, it, it, it was, it was it, in many ways, it's living the dream, isn't it? Especially it's for, so exciting. Um, for, you know, a former nerdy kid come nerdy adult. It's um, yeah, we were, we were loving doing that. So I, I think the bottom line was it got to the point where we couldn't guarantee the time for rehearsals for theater anymore because you know if we suddenly last minute got called out to do a gig for 50 quid in the arse end of nowhere that was the priority yeah you know? and, because and that's what we wanted and i think it's so at some point so the, again the sort of chronologic the the timeline of when we sort of officially went okay we will focus solely on the magic was we were just in 20 14 um we were disbanding the theater company that we'd started we we were starting basically we started a theater company it was like a site specific thing we did like um we did shows in the open air we did shows that were pub crawls it was just weird inventive theater that, that no one could tell us not, not to do it and so we had a good time and we didn't have to pay for a theater yeah. and we didn't have to pay for a theater yeah yeah we used to do pub crawl theater we do a different different scene in every pub some of the pubs didn't know we were turning up um and <laughs> Uh, we were literally like there was there was definitely a pub where we every Tuesday we would turn up and do a scene from a Christmas Carol in there uh, at full volume in in their pub, um, and every week they were like it was a surprise oh, to them. Yeah, incredible. Uh, do we know you? And we're like, we're <laughs> too late now. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so we sat we we set up this theatre with, with with some friends, and uh, then one of our friends was uh, was uh, was moving away. Uh, and the other one was getting into a more hectic full-time job. So it was largely just going to be the two of us anyway, running this theatre company. And in 2014, we booked our first Edinburgh Fringe run to do the cabaret show. So we'd really perfected 20 minutes. Uh, we had we had an opening 10 minutes, and then we had the closing 10 minutes, which was our straight jacket escape, which we still do. Uh, so we'd perfected 20 minutes by 2014. Well, you know, perfected, you know, good. It was all right. It was good uh, enough. It was good enough. So we booked we booked an entire twenty five night run at the Edinburgh Fringe to do the the locking cabaret as it's called, um, and that just gave us an opportunity to say, okay, let's double down on we are now magicians and comedians, and then we just and, and then and then that that sort of just snowballed really. The Edinburgh Fringe is really what I that sort of that year at the Edinburgh Fringe is what I consider to be us going. Okay, we'll start taking this seriously. We'll start yeah, seeing that's when we started doing it properly. Yeah, like we'll see if we can actually make a go of this. Um, and luckily, the first our first fringe run um, was through blind panic, luck, and just pure pig headedness. Um, for twenty five nights, uh, we didn't have a single seat free the entire run um, because we were just adamant that we were going to fill that room and make people see us. And bearing in mind, we were we were like flyering for like twelve hours a day, and you know just absolutely hammering it. Um, because we we've do... been given we've been given quite a rough time slot for our first show. It was uh, it was twenty past twelve, was it that first year? At 20, night? Yeah, 20, 20 past midnight. Yeah, yeah. And sort yeah. of so so we we turned up to the venue like the night before our first show because that was that was your sort of your your tech time. Uh, we we went up with uh, PBH Free Fringe. Um, uh, and so, you know, you sort of, you get what you're given. And um, so, so we, we rocked up and we were looking at the room and we were like, okay, this room could work. It's, it's small, it's intimate, but we can make this work. And the venue owner, it was like the function room of a bar, the voodoo rooms, uh, the owner came in and sort of said, not going to lie to you boys, you got your work cut out. No, no, you know, no, no one's managed to make this, this time slot work. Yeah. Basically he said, it was like, there's a reason that slot was free. Good yeah. luck. And then we, we we went away from that tech time, and we and bear in mind the opening show was the next day, yeah. and we thought, oh no, this could be the longest month of our entire lives. Yeah. Um, but what that made us do was we were literally we were out on we were out in the streets by midday the next day, and from midday until twenty past twelve in the evening, we, we were, were handing out flyers. We were doing guest spots. We were we were we were shouting, screaming, doing street shows, trying to just get rid of flyers to get people into the show. And I specifically remember, do you remember opening night? Opening night, we had we had a guest spot across town. 
about 40 minutes before our show. So we just done a quick five minutes to promote the show. We ran across town and it was about, it, we got there about midnight. And at about midnight, we ran up to the venue and I went, oh Christ, what, like we can't, what's going can't on? Get in. We can't get, there's so many different rooms and that they clearly kicked out at the wrong times and it was looking like a shambles. And so there's this huge crowd of people outside. And I went, oh, what's going on? They said, oh, we're waiting for the cabaret show. And we literally were like, <laughs> so, sorry, the, not the lock-in cabaret. Yeah, yeah, yeah went, that's the one. And then we and then we opened the door. We ran in, we flung the doors open, put some audience music on, and they fucking poured in. And again, and, that it, was, and it was standing room only. And that yeah. was that that was the month, basically. I remember the lineup as well, because it was it was so warm in my heart. I remember exactly who was on the show. Go on, um, I don't. I, it was Ian Kendall. Of course it was oh, Ian Kendall. Oh yeah, of course. Oh. We, Ian Kendall and I, I like I have all the time in the world for Ian Kendall. Oh, basically, he's done so much for us. Bearing in mind, in 2014, we didn't know, we didn't know any magicians. We knew nobody. Um, we, most of the acts on the lock-in, because we obviously because we did magic, so we didn't need to know magicians. We knew burlesque acts, we knew singers, we knew comedians. That was fine. Um, you know that that's a variety show for us. Um, but we chanced our arm and just messaged Ian Kendall and said, because uh, we we bumped into him the year before. Doing street shows, yeah. No, no, uh, no. It was, it was. He, we sat next to him in an audience. Oh it was, yeah. Because previously, I was a member of his online, you know, the virtual magic show, his online community, uh, and you know, tutorial. You know, he was like, I, I think probably one of the first doing that. You know, a kind of mm. a, a whole, you know, tutorial and courses and stuff online. And I was a part of that. And we'd gone to see. Um, Paul and Paul, Paul Zenon was interviewing Paul Daniels. Yeah. It was like a, just like he was doing like maybe two, maybe it was a one off. I can't remember. It was for charity. It yeah. was a charity show. That's it. So we sat down and I looked over my shoulder and there was Ian Kendall sort of towering over me, sat next to me. Um, and he was chatting to some other guys. And when there was a lulling conversation, I sort of said, hi, Ian. Sorry, he just wanted to say, you know, um, really enjoy your work. I'm part of your online thing. And he was like, what's your name? I said, Steve. He said, Steve Griffin from Guildford. I was like, Jesus Christ, this man's insane. Um, and we just got chatting and, you know, sort of became friends on Facebook. So then, yeah, when we when we were running our own show, we asked him, we chanced our arm with him and very, very generously. No he's a proper fringe veteran, you know. Yeah, he's, yeah. he's done like 30 odd years at the fringe, you know, the man's a machine. Um, and so yeah, basically, he, yeah, when we asked him, we said, you know, do you want to come out at half 12 at night for no money and potentially perform to, to us um and he was just like sure because sure. <laughs> um, he gets the fringe he, gets, he, yeah. he knows that that's what it is you know um, but yeah there are there are definitely there are, like i'm sure everyone's got them but there are always certain people that i will always thank and always have time for and he oh, is yeah. one of them because when we knew nobody ian was kind to us he was very kind to us yeah yeah ian's amazing i've interviewed him on this channel i know him really well he's oh, he's wonderful yeah really great guy yeah so, yeah Here's a question. So I have two questions about the fringe. Mm. Three questions, actually. Now, the first question is, in our story that we were telling up until this point, you have full time jobs. Yeah. Mm. But now you're going up to Scotland for a month, mm -hmm. working every hour God sends to fill a theatre. Mm -hmm. Did you take a sabbatical or were you just yeah, like... very understanding employers at that point? Yeah. 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 Um, that was I'm, tr I'm trying to think whether I was working at the school at that time. Um, but it was August, so it didn't matter, obviously. Well, um, this is the thing. Yeah, if I was working at the school, then I'd have been off for August uh, anyway. Uh, yeah. My timeline's a little bit hazy at that point. I, I, I was probably at the was, school and part-time at the pub, I suspect. Because yeah. I was a pastry chef, uh, and I just um, I got very lucky that my boss got it. And, you know, I said, I, said, I promise I'll come back in September. And then, <laughs> and, then and then in 2016, I didn't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, oh. Because maybe and that was always the plan. Um, yeah, 2016 was the year we both quit our jobs. Um, well, I want to and... get in. I want to get into that because the other thing I was going to ask you about the fringe is, I, I you know I've interviewed a lot of people that spend a lot of time on the fringe. Mm -hmm. uh, Oliver Meach, uh, yeah. uh, Love uh, Tom Crosby, yeah, uh, yeah. Elliot Bibby. I've interviewed yeah. a lot of people and I've asked them about the fringe, and a lot of them have said there's really two, you don't go there to make money. There's really well, you can. Oh, there. you can. Initially, when you first get there, a lot of the time it's not to make a fortune. First, first year's a gamble. First year's yeah. definitely a gamble. Uh, to be honest, every year's a gamble. Um, but 
yeah if you go about it right you, you yeah you, can, you know we we've we've always made money at the fringe it's, it's anyway sorry a... what, what what sorry what was the question no, was there another motive like were you wanting to get noticed by an agent or a pr company or an event planner were you looking to like we just wanted to do it or we, was it just hey we want we've got this act we think it's amazing we would just at the fringe is a place where we can go and perform it was just get it was a bit of an adventure it was a chance to just get the stage time to run our own show mm. in the biggest arts festival in the world yeah yeah it's just uh, yeah it was... i mean we'd 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 crowdfunded that first year we we set up a whole kickstarter and we did fundraising shows and stuff because we 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 assumed that we would make an absolute loss Mm -hmm. um and certainly that first year was a lesson in learning how to make the fringe work for you um you know we certainly carried a lot of those lessons forward which then enabled us to make money in subsequent years um but yeah it was just it was just an opportunity to do a thing really yeah to to to, to live as magicians for a month and you know try it on for size and mm -hmm yeah just just commit to it just do it and but also throughout, with like, a bit of a safety net that we'd come back to jobs at the end yeah. of it i mean throughout throughout the sort of time we've been doing the fringe we can attribute so much now to everything we've done at the fringe like so much oh, of yeah. our career is just yeah. so hunkered down in everything we've done at the fringe because we've done so much we for a for a bit of publicity recently i roughly calculated um i think we're a uh, we're about 800 plus shows we've run at the fringe now um which is full, just full length shows yeah. which is just insanity it's insanity yeah. to say that um uh but what that's enabled us to do is especially running the cabaret shows where we can have five different guest acts every night means that we our networking is running a show we don't go to a networking event we just and um so the cabaret we run we when we got that 12 uh 20 slot and like i said that first year went really well um, and then all the times uh, the time slots shifted um, for reasons out of our control, um, so that it got pushed back. And and it's been at one a.m. since twenty fifteen. So it's now the one a.m. show, um, and it's every night, and it's the whole month. Um, and somehow through it, because we can always make it full, we know we can fill the room now, um, and we know we can get a good crowd. If what that's meant is we've been able to book so many different acts, which means that we just we know everyone um, just through because we need people for the show and they want to promote their show. So people, you know, people like you've mentioned, people like people like Tom Crosby, people like Elliot Bibby, all the magicians that have come through, they all do our lock-in. They do at one at one a.m. You'll see them at the back of the room getting ready to do their ten minutes and promote their show. You know, and we've throughout the years we've uh, I've lost count of the sort of amount of just really good friends and good contacts we've made yes. through doing that. Um, you know, so much of our work has started there. You know, people go, oh, well, we work with these guys in Edinburgh that can host and are funny and do magic. And, and then you get asked to do something else and you do other festivals. Um, so, yeah, the, the Edinburgh Fringe was such a such a firework in starting us going, right, this will be a job now. Oh, it was instrumental. Yeah. yeah. That's incredible. That's incredible. So before we move on from the Fringe, if you could give somebody that's watching this that wants to do the fringe one piece of advice, they've never done it before. They're wanting to do it. They think they've got a good show. The, the advice doesn't have to be about the show. They think they've got a good show. Mm -hmm. One piece of advice would you give them? Uh, one piece what? is difficult. I think my big, my biggest piece would be know why you're going. Yeah. Um, because if you're there to make money, there are ways to do that. If you're there to get seen, there are ways to try and encourage that. And those two aren't necessarily compatible with each other. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're there to try and clean up or, or get an award, then there are ways to do that. But again, you've got to, you've got to plan out why you're going there in order to, to try and achieve those things. You yeah. Know, if you just go up there just to do shows, which is what we did to start with, then you might have a great time and have a great run. You might absolutely die on your ass and cry yourself to sleep every night um we've had those days. can happen like, and we've yeah, had both of those things you know yeah i don't wanna, i don't want to paint the fringe experience that we've had you know this we've done uh again covid years mess it up because there was a break in the middle but i think we've done nine full years um at the fringe um and have we not done the full 10 i thought i thought i thought we did it 
I nah, not, not quite. Did we not? Not oh, that's quite. disappointing. Um, and I know, yeah, just a nice round number because we're having a year off this year, and that was oh, our, really? yeah, I'd like reasons. Uh, we're having we're having a year off this year, and um, uh, yeah, it's really annoying we've not done the full ten. Um, but but yeah, some years are really hard. Like one year, so the, I think the twenty sixteen year, which was which was the fringe we did, then I came back and quit my job. Not purely on the back of that, but it was very hinged on it. Um, we had, uh, they they put our, so we had the cabaret, which was in the same room, and then they put our magic show in a, a venue called La Belle Angel, which was a 250 seat uh, magic uh, sort of theatre venue. And the year before we were in a 40 seat and we were like, oh my God, I'm, like we're going to rattle. We'll never, we'll never get that many people in, never. Mm. And through some spark, some something in the air that year, the time slot, the venue, I don't know what it was. It was a perfect combination. You know, the title of the show, we, some days we were turning them away and I couldn't believe it. We were just out of our mind. We'd never played to 250 we people for a full Which hour. Edinburgh Fringe is insane. You know, every year you read articles saying, oh, the average audience size is eight or whatever, yeah, you yeah. know, <laughs> then... Then you know some of us by some fluke of filling up a two hundred seater or whatever. Yeah. I think it helped that that year they had a really strong magic lineup in that. Thing. Yes, we were we, we were sandwiched between... with Paul De Beck. We were there Tom with Peterson. Uh, Tom Peterson. Yeah, you know it was, it was it was a good year to be in that venue, and we just then... sort of, we rode those coattails, you know, all all the way through that month yeah. really. But comparatively, then the next year. They put us literally 500 yards down the road in a similar size venue. And we, if we had 50, if we, if we had 50 and we were happy and that was a hard year, 50, you know, you know, whereas I do 50 people in a theater that seats 300 is empty. It's empty. Yeah. Yep. Um, and it was 50 people every night. And it meant that they didn't, it meant that the show wasn't as good because they weren't, that you couldn't carry the energy. No atmosphere. You couldn't get a, a, a roll of laughter going. You were just, you were fighting for every moment and it was exhausting. Yeah. Exhausting. Yeah. So, so my, my one piece of advice would be if you are going, if you already decide, if you're like, right, I am definitely going. Um, I would just say number one rule is like, do everything, work, just work really hard. Um, uh, flyering because... guest spots whatever a anytime you're not promoting your show you're potentially letting audiences slip away yeah unfortunately just, if you want full rooms do everything have the big posters around town pay a pr stand on the streets and flyer do whatever you can we don't we, we don't pay people to do pr because we we're up there to make money and we're up there to do it ourselves and we're happy to fly it for hours and hours a day. If you're not happy, pay someone to do it. You can't, if, if, if you don't put anything into PR and promotion, there are there are 3,000 shows on every single day. Um, like, if you don't put, if you don't tell people that your show is on, they'll go and see one of the other 3,000. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be my one piece of advice. But it's oh, actually, actually a wonderful place. What, one other piece of advice, be really particular about the title of your show. Mm. Like, like we're a big fan of take the Ron Seal approach of naming your show. Make it do what it says on the tin, because you know you've got people flicking through, you know, uh, a, a, a program that's you know that thick. Or I, I don't even know if they still print those. Actually, they were really cutting. Yeah, down they do. That. Yeah. But either so, you know, the website and the app, you've got thousands and thousands of shows for people to just scroll by. You know, you you get you get snow blind going through them all. You you've your, your, your image and your title in the program uh, is probably one of the more mm. instrumental things in making sure you get an audience. It took us a couple of years to realise that. That one year we got really lucky, that kind of 2016, before we'd got any kind of reputation up there and we got really lucky, was the year we called it Slap Dash Magic, which I yeah. think is a bit of a kind of does what it says on the tin. Yeah. Um, and then we had a few years where we went a bit too clever with some titles and it, people didn't know what it meant. Did, and then last year... Off. And then for the last two years, we called our show Idiot Magicians and a life-changing magic show because it does what it says on the tin. Hmm. That's great. That's really good advice. <laughs> and ironically, you mentioned Elliot Bibby earlier on. When I interviewed him, he said exactly the same thing, uh, that the show title is, is so important. Yeah. Has he told you? Oh, no, I know. I, maybe I shouldn't say that. He's got an amazing show title that he's ready to use. And he's not using it until 
He said he wants to use it when he's got enough money to promote it, and it is the best. It's the best title for his show. I don't want to say it because I'm not sure. He- <laughs> You'll have to ask him about it next time you oh, see it's him. So cool. Well, I remember seeing his um, uh, Elliot Bibby and the Mind Reading Beach Ball. Yeah. Yes. Which was just a great title. You know, it, it, it immediately yeah. makes you interested, right? Yeah, it? yeah, 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 totally. Yeah. Okay, so. You've mentioned 2016 uh, a bunch of times, Nathan, as that is the time that you quit your job. Yeah. So you started doing Fringe in 2014. Mm-hmm. Was that when you guys thought, you know what, the Fringe is working for us. We've just come off the back of this 250-seater extravaganza every night. You know, everything's going well in many different ways. I imagine that off the back of the Fringe, like you said, you're getting work doing other things. Yeah. Is that when you guys decided to go full-time? You're like, you know what, we can make this work. And if that's the case, I have a follow-up question because I, I, as I say, I've been in a double act. And one of the things that was most difficult for me was the financial side of things. Yeah. Yeah. People Taking half pay on every that. gig. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Of that, when you're a double act, you immediately, if you're going to make the same as you would do if you're uh, on your own, you have yeah. to double your fee and there's yeah. place. And then, then you become, but you're pricing yourself way more expensive than other people. Now we are only, <laughs> yeah, we're only just, and only with certain clients, we are only just able to command 50% extra. Um, yeah, and- the idea of doubling your fee, you're, um, for, you're, again, for some people, you'll get away with it. Um, but for a lot of folk, you won't, you know, especially for, you know, we, we still do a lot on like the cabaret circuit and things like that. And at the end of the day, those people, it's a very simple equation. They have the number of seats, they have the price of the, or their cut from each ticket. They multiply those together and that's the budget for their show. And mm. then they have to divide that between themselves and all the acts that they're booking for the show. You know, you just, for shows like that, you, you don't, you don't, or we don't do them for the money. We do them because we love them. And because yeah, like we, 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 we consider still... cabaret our home still in 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 many ways. Yeah. And cab- again, cabaret, the cabaret circuit, you know, again, it's it's definitely died down when we started in 2013. The cabaret circuit was so big. But we, oh, even then, even, you know, even then we did we were doing, you know, the Magic Night and Madame Jojo's in Soho for 160 quid. I mean, that was, by the time, we don't live in London. By the time we, yeah, train by the time ticket, we paid our train fare, there's not a lot left. There's nothing. You, you get a burger on the way home and you, you've made sod all. Um, but so, it was magic night at Madame Jojo's. And mm-hmm. the first, you know, again, I remember when we first got contacted for that and I was giddy with excitement because we'd not done a show with other magicians and Cassia, God bless her heart, contacted us and said, you look quite interesting. Do you want to do 10 minutes for no money? And obviously, <laughs> we, bit, and obviously we bit our hand off for it. And then I looked at the lineup, and it was um, it was Christian Lee and um, and Max Somerset, who I remember rushing home from my Saturday job when I was twelve years old to watch Max Magic, and I was like, "Oh my god, I'm on a show with them!" And it was just it was incredible, wow. it was the most, ex- most right. exciting thing in the world. And I think largely to an extent, and probably to our detriment. Honestly, we are the worst business people in the world. Oh yeah, probably probably to our detriment is that we still do it largely just because we love it. And we make a living. We make a living. Don't get me wrong. You know, we, like the, the, there's no holes in this roof, and my I have you know socks on. I'm fine. We're doing all right. Um, but we are terrible business people because we just do stuff because we enjoy it, and mm. and that's the love. You know, if we wanted to make money, we wouldn't be magicians. <laughs> <laughs> there are better. Th- there are easier ways of making money. But we've we've always said if we had a manager, we could take over the world. Unfortunately, no bugger wants to take us on. So no, I don't no, know what right. you're going to do? Um, and it definitely we we joked actually at the weekend because we obviously we saw you at the weekend, Craig. Um, and someone was talking to us about bookings, and uh, and I said it was really funny because obviously we've just done our end of year counts, and and it was looking at that, and I went, oh, if this was a solo act, I would be a wealthy man. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah, not, it's... We, we had an acceptable year for one person between <laughs> us mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. Uh, but it's not we're, so we're not so yeah we just we 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 yeah we we work a lot and we and we enjoy it and we get by you know we're still trying to make you know we're still we're still growing biz- the business as it were and getting oh, better yeah. it gets it better growing. every year 
Yeah. Um, but I mean, if that's someone... the thing, right? You've only been, I, I know it sounds like oh, 2012, 13. That's the, yeah, when you look at that as a business. It's young like... for a business, yeah. yeah. Uh, and again, we've only been we're, we're still we're still solvent, we're still functioning, and, and yeah. that's that's well, a result you, for a small business. Have you ever considered? You talked about a manager. You know, you've got such a great reputation now, and you've you know you you're very well known on the um, uh, uh, on the Edinburgh Fringe circuit, and and obviously I know you do uh, a lot of cruise liners and so on and so forth. Have you ever thought about getting somebody like a gag reflex to promote? So gag reflex of books us for lots of things and then never sign us. It's really weird. Yeah, they, they've they've ne they've never wanted to have the conversation. You know, they've uh, yeah, strange. They, they've hired us on spec for things. So my, you know, my favorite if they wanted one, us. I'm they know where to find us. My favorite one with gag reflex. It makes me laugh every time. Is we performed for them a few times. We then did the wedding of an agent from Gag Reflex. He said, come and perform at my wedding. It was us and Tate Face and Matt Ricardo, who were all signed, and we performed at their wedding and they didn't sign us. That's a bit weird. Isn't it? I know. <laughs> Isn't it? Maybe they were waiting for us to approach them and have the conversation. I don't at their know. Wedding. Like, yeah, like we said, no, 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 not there, obviously, but you know, just generally. L like Nay says, we're the worst businessmen in the world. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and we just like luckily, and again, this like our, you know, all of our businesses, referrals, repeat bookings, that kind of thing. Um, and we very much subscribe to the. Uh, I, I'm sure it's been mentioned many times on the podcast because it's a very it's a very well used piece of advice, which was that we put so much effort into the show and we were like, let's just like if, make the show really good. And then when people see it, they'll want to book it and we won't have to chase leads and follow up and do all of this business things. Just make the show really good um, because it's what, the what's Steve the Martin. thing? Be, be too good to ignore? It's the Steve Martin advice of being so good they can't ignore you. That's it. That's it. Um, which is just the most, it, it, like, that's the most wonderful advice. Just be, like, you're so good. They can't ignore you forever. Mm. Um, and They're I doing think, a good job so far, but, you know, we'll think, get them. Yeah, we'll get to the end. We'll get to them at some point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, because, yeah, um, yeah, it's just, we're just, that's not, we're, we're, that's not our strength. Our strength is not running a business. Uh, and unfortunately, it should be, but we're getting there. We're getting there. Yeah. Well, on that subject, you know, I mean, one thing. OK, so you mentioned this earlier, but you're not really uh, you, you don't really spend much time in the magic community, mm -hmm. probably because you're so busy working on the show and you're so busy kind of being in your own little bubble that it's it's difficult to. But I've noticed in the last year you have been more in the community like just in the last year, year and a half, you entered and obviously won the IBM stage competition, which was yeah. huge. I was in the yeah. audience. You were the clear winner of everything. Oh, oh thank bless you. you. Um, no, you were. You, you you just were. It was just insanely good. Then, obviously, we met last weekend where you were lecturing and performing at the Wessex Magic Convention. Yeah. Uh, you, you lectured recently at the Magic Circle. The reason I bring all of this up is because a lot of acts like your like like yourselves they get a big percentage of their income from getting booked by conventions and mm. getting booked by um, you know, a lot of the time just for a gala show. But then obviously you guys have got a lecture as well, which was yeah. incredible and, and, and very different to anything else. So have you considered kind of going down that route more? I know the organizers of Blackpool watch this. Ha! Ha! So, we, so we'd love to. So uh, this is actually what we're talking about, which is the fact that I think for so long we'd avoided it because we assumed that no one cared. Um, and then we got asked to do one lecture and then we enjoyed it and it went all right. So we we are sort of moving a little bit in that direction. Yeah. Yeah, we sort of. We, we, we'd we spent so long, um, like you say, Craig, just sort of doing our own thing, plugging away, performing for the public because, you know, that that's our audience. Um, but then, yeah. Sort of two years ago, we did, we, we did have the awkward conversation of should we just play the game a little bit more and sort of work the magic, you know, just just try and get our name out in the magic yeah. community. Because well, I you remember, know... oh god, because I remember we had that conversation. There was a very specific conversation, and I won't tell you what it was for because it's unfair to the people that it was that it's about. Um, there was something was booked. There was a show that was being booked, and the acts that were booked for it were okay but i went no no 
we should have got that. We should have 100% got that gig. Again, you know, you just see something that's so sort of, you go, that's it's got your name written all over it. That's your gig. And, mm. and the only reason we did get booked for it was because magicians had no idea who we were. Um, and that's and that's the point where I said, right, let's poke our heads up, do a few conventions, yeah. let people know who we are. Yeah. And then, and actually weirdly off the back of that, we so we did, we did a couple of conventions and then we did get booked for something that we wouldn't have otherwise got. And I was like, I'm really annoyed that we were right. <laughs> Damn it, we've been proved right. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, that's the thing. Like, uh, funnily enough, I was talking to Tom Crosby today. Um, uh, he's, he's coming in on a ship. Uh, he's coming in on a ship tomorrow. I'm going to see him tomorrow. Um, but uh, so I was talking to him today about Blackpool, actually. And we would really love to do Blackpool. Um, I would just like to do a show there and maybe do a lecture or, you know, do a spot in the gala or something like that. Because... I think that it would be, I think it would be really enjoyable. And by the sounds of it, I think we might be okay for it. Yeah, I think you would be. Well, I know you would be. Like I, I, Your act is incredible and it's very fresh and it's very different. It's very unique. Um, and I think that it's, it, well, I remember seeing you in the IBM stage competition. I told you this on su uh, Sunday. You fooled the absolute hell out of me. I was laughing <laughs> my ass off, and I was fooled in equal measure. It was it was brilliant. You oh, know, that's very that's very kind. Yeah, I get it. And that the, the IBM convention was, and we have to like. Um, this is another person who I will always be grateful for is uh, 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 Ollie Tabor. Yeah, um, Oliver Tabor. Not only obviously, like people know Oliver Tabor. He was the president of the IBM. He's got this amazing act, Fism, blah blah blah. He's, he's incredible. He knows he is. Um, and but he's always been so much of a champion of ours been he's a great always, advocate for us yeah. yeah um and so he said he was the one that because he was president of the ibm in the uh, it was the year coming up he was just about to be president and he said but i'm organizing the convention and he said i'll be honest with you boys he said the acts that are entered the acts i've got lined up for the stage competition competition at the moment none of them are specific comedy acts so if you want to come and just get the comedy trophy like I think you've you, got you a might, decent shot at it. Yeah. You've got a decent shot. So we ummed and erred, and again, it was coming around that time where we said, "Or oh, maybe we should let magicians know who we are." Because we so, hadn't done a competition in a long time. We did a couple early on to very yeah. mix, like small ones, to very mix success, and we just kind of come to the opinion that our act isn't for magicians. Mm. You know, like you you say that 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 routine fooled you, and that's that's lovely, but you know, it's that that's never our intention to try and fool magicians um mm. and so we were very much in two minds about it but we thought you know what we, we we want to start playing the game a little bit more getting a comedy award for an act like ours is gonna look really good yeah you know our, you know, we, our, our we, award shelf was very barren yeah and then and then again then so and what was good was the fact that the IBM convention was about four days after we got back from Edinburgh Bridge. And some people might go, oh, God, what, that, that must be so stressful, the turnaround. You go, no, 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 we've just had a month to rehearse a hundred times in front of audiences. So oh, we, we were match fit for that routine, yeah. So we yeah. rolled straight out of the Edinburgh Fringe and just did 10 minutes of our show. That was, that was, that was the act. We just did 10 minutes from our show. And because we were so fresh out of the you know out of doing it so many times it meant that we knew it inside out it wasn't a convention act it was just backwards and forwards you know inside that and and i'll be honest with you and like um it was yolin we were up against yolin lee the uh the korean manipulation act yeah um and funny that we spoke to ollie a week before the convention and we said um we said uh right come on come on be honest with us who's who's in the competition and he was like Oh, there was, uh, there's a guy named Yolin Lee who was a Korean manipulation act. And when he did his audition at the Magic Circle, he got a standing ovation. And we went, well, that's that then. <laughs> well, we might get the comedy award. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. But, it, it, but it took, what it did was it took the pressure off. Could we yeah. genuinely? And, and this is, I'm not, like, I really mean this truthfully. We did the sound check with him on the day. And he and he was doing his act during this during the test without props, without props, and, and it was more magical him. than anything we've ever put on stage. You know, we walked up to him afterwards and said, "Congratulations." Um, <laughs> we meant it, and now and now it feels really disingenuous. It feels like a really horrible thing to say because then we were stood on stage and and we and we we won. Um, but and we were just so convinced. But what it did was it meant we were so relaxed. We didn't care. 
because we were like, he's not going to win the comedy award because he's a silent manipulation act. Um, and as, lo as long as we got some laughs out of the audience, we we'd done our job at that point. Um, but it just meant that we it just meant that we relaxed and did the show as is. And it was Tom Stone was it was Tom Stone and Nicola Arcane were, were, were some of the judges that year. Yeah. And luckily, I think we just we we managed to get in. I think we have a very similar sort of humour to Tom Stone by the sounds of things. Because I remember him coming up to us afterwards and saying how much he laughed. And again, we were flattered because. Yeah, and I remember you You came up to us, Craig. I remember you came up to yeah. us. And it was in the pub after you came up to us and Tom Stone came up to us and a few other people came up to us and we were just blown away. And we were like, this is the first time we performed for magicians in about seven years and it went all right. Um, and then off the back of that, Ollie asked us to do his, his president's dinner, dinner and then we got the Magic Circle lecture off the back of that and then we did this thing. So, yeah, big thanks to Ollie Tabor because he just, he was willing to say nice things about us and book us for something. Um, and it's it's led and to some really nice things. Into going yeah. out of our comfort zone and doing something different. Yeah, that's brilliant. Mm. Well, let me let me ask you the big question that I've been kind of leading up to. <laughs> Excuse me, which is double acts. You don't see many of them in the UK. No, uh, not many good ones. Many of them. Yeah, not many proper very, ones. Very very few. Uh, off the. I couldn't even, yeah, I can probably think about four or five. But I get questions on my channel all the time about, I'm thinking about putting a double act together. And a lot of the time, I think people are wanting to put a double act together because they're nervous about doing it on their own. Yeah. And they want somebody else on stage to bounce off because mm -hmm. they think having that person there will fill them up with more confidence, mm -hmm. which I don't necessarily think is the right way to approach a double act. But as you guys, the experts here, like, I, I know I said to you my big pet hate, and I see this all the time with double acts. I mentioned this to you last weekend, was yeah. when I see a double act where it's like, hey, I'm so-and-so, and I'm so-and-so. Now they go off and disappear into the wings. Yeah, the they, they do 10 minutes, minutes, then they do That's minutes. not a double act. That's a two-hander, That's uh, which is fine, but it's not a double act. That's 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 a two-hand show. Um, yeah. yeah, no, a, a, a double act is a, it's a very specific thing, isn't it? I mean, I'll be honest, I've seen two performers on stage at the same time working at the same time and i wouldn't necessarily call them a double act mm -hmm. i think I, I think i think cohesion really is is the key to it isn't it it's you know for, for us what we do it just wouldn't work without the other one there it's because we write very conversationally um and again yeah. so and uh, structure know, and everything yeah. very yeah um, and also, I think, like, for, for for me, I do think it is, I, I think we got a lot better, a lot quicker than we would as, as separate solo acts, because you can see the other one, you're aware of things that people are doing wrong, again, if, even if we just discount the magic, we pretend like you're just, you're just, you know, you're, you're a comedy double act, or just a speaking double act, or whatever, if you just discount the tricks, um, you just, you start, you hold yourself accountable to the other person. So you need yes. to learn your lines. You need to pick up the cues. Um, and also you have to, you know, you have to trust each other enough that, that's you know, huge. yeah, that's a big one. Actually, this is a, this is secondhand advice um, from Morgan and Wes, which is the, you don't have to like each other. You have to respect each other. Yeah. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong, like, me and Stephen mates, we're all right. Um, but, <laughs> but the bottom line is you have to respect each other. So if, if, if one, like, like we both messed up massively on stage. Maybe. Or even even not messing up, just trying a different delivery or yeah. going off on a bit of improv. And after the show, one of us might go up to the other one and go, Don't do that again. Yeah, stop. And you stop and you that. just have to go, Oh, okay. Yeah. Because I okay. I have to trust Nathan. Nathan has to trust me that, you know, we've both got we've both got the good of the act at heart. And we can we can see each other performing slightly from the outside, you know, not not to the extent as say a director could off the stage, but you know, yeah, we we can pick up on each other's performances and deliveries, and yeah. you know, the, the the only people who can give us notes after a show are each other. Mm -hmm. And it's it, and it's really helpful. It, it's it you you yeah. pick up because it's like. Like, but you've got to put your ego aside for you it. You have to put your ego aside. And it's towards you, again, like this is this is a sort of constant joke with double X kind of thing, but it's like being a married couple. But in terms of in terms of being around each other for all that time, it a little bit is because we all know that, you know, 
you know, your, your sort of better half, as it were, kind of thing. You would you spend so much time around them. But the tiny little things that they do, the teeny tiny things, the fact that they will always clear their throat after every time they drink a drink, or the fact, that they, <laughs> the, the fact, the fact they always whistle when they're mopping up, or so, those things start to drive you mad. And you go, they don't realize they're doing it. And it's such a little thing, but I'm around it so often that you start to pick up on it. And being in a double act, like there are certain things like, like I know I say certain words on stage way too much, mm. like just certain phrases and words. And it drives me mad and Steve will pick up on me. He'll go, you had a very heavy night of saying, like one of my one of my big ones I'm trying to stop saying is bless your heart. A anytime someone will have an interaction, I'll be like, oh my God, bless your heart. And Steve's like, you had a very bless your heart night this evening. And I go, oh shit. And, I, 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 and one of my big ones is that's right. Like that's right, yeah. Nath will set a premise down and I go, that's right. So what we're getting at is, and when that's every sentence, you have to have someone who's just going to gently take you aside and say, stop it. Stop doing that, um, yeah. And yeah, that, 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 that is part of it. Um, well, the, fa the favourite thing when you're a double act, though, which no one tells you about, which is the, you have to actually be able to read each other's minds because at some point in the act, something we all know as magicians, usually when something goes wrong, it's gone wrong a few minutes before the audience is about to find out about it. Yeah. And then you need to try and communicate that to the other one without breaking the script. So there's been there's been times where our brains are furiously burning holes in the other one's head, just going, "Stop! Stop! I've messed up! I've completely messed up! Please stop!" Um, but again, it comes back to what we were talking about right at the start of this about how. You know how how we have this of this chemistry, this this pacing, this rhythm of how we work together. If one of us starts breaking that pacing, to the other one, it's like being hit round the head with a wok. You know, it's like you just you know something has gone badly wrong somewhere. Oh, the and... moment one of us goes badly off script, the other one's job is to talk as much as is humanly possible yeah. and, and and flail to, widely yeah. to step we know... to the front of the stage yeah. you know draw all eyes uh because while we the other one is trying wrong. to fix their cock up yeah yeah and we've had some we've had some absolute beauties do you remember the first just because craig you'll enjoy this uh this is a proper monumental cock up um so we used to do a thing where we would we would borrow a bowl we, when, as people came into the room we would get them to dig out old receipts from their what from their wallets and handbags and put them in a bowl. Um, we would then it was all about that kind of we carry around these receipts and why do we carry them around us? We don't need them. We'd have someone pick one out. We'd do a little bit of mind reading nonsense with it. But the end of the show was a big long number prediction, which was the transaction number on the receipt. Um, and between doing the previews and taking it to the fringe. We had changed that long number and not printed new receipts. Yeah, we changed the revelation, but kept the old method. So the end of night one at the end of the fringe <laughs> started with, okay, can you read that number off? Four, one, two, five, nine, seven, six. And we went, nope. Close enough. <laughs> Close enough. <laughs> <laughs> that, the end of our show finished with the words, Close enough. <laughs> Wow. And at that point, there's there's nothing you can do. And yeah, again, at that, at that and, point, and, there's nothing you can do. If it's something as simple as um, accidentally Mercury folding two cards off the deck uh, and not having a clue which is the right one, then uh, just we have to vamp until the other one has figured out what the hell's going on. That, that know, feels weirdly stuff specific, like that. Steve, I'll be honest with you. Yeah, that feels weirdly specific. <laughs> no, I don't know. That was just that was just <laughs> off the top of my head. I, all I'm saying is that's happened half a dozen times now. <laughs> In the last month. I'm not very good at that. Um, <laughs> but at so least like, it's happened enough now that you know how to fix it, you know? Yeah, and often yeah. that's what magic is, isn't it? Yeah. You know, it, it, it's you it, do it, it enough times that you know how something if it's going to go wrong, you know how it's going to go wrong and you learn to preempt it and or remedy it. You know, we, we we've all been there. Um but yeah, but, it, you know, it's nice having someone else on the stage who can do a bit of the audience work whilst you go into outward autopilot and while you know kicking yeah, your yeah, feet yeah. madly under the water trying to stay afloat but yeah I th I, I, for, for me the kind of the tips for I, I don't think you can give tips about whether to start a double act because you'll only know if it's right for you but i think the tips of staying in a double act would be firstly only work together i genuinely think that's otherwise 
if you're doing separate magic shows on your own, I don't think it works. So only work together. Um, you have to respect each other um, and just like always keep it fresh, keep it going. Like we run lines before every show. You know, the when we did the gala show with you guys at the weekend, you know, that those were routines we've done a thousand times. And we still we still went out into the car park before the show and just ran some lines just to make sure that we were snappy snap fresh. And um, because again, when you're a double act, if you're if if at any point one of you drops a line, it looks really obvious because there's just a pause where where you sort of look at each other and go, nothing, no, okay, fine. Um, but again, we we know the script well enough that if one of us is half a beat behind on a delivery, the other one just picks up the slack. Yeah. Again, you just have to, yeah, you have to just really work hard. And again, it comes animal. down to scripting, you know, whether you're a double act or not, script your damn magic. Yeah. Script your magic. Anyone, like anyone who says don't script, I think is wrong. I've never heard anyone's, anyone whose opinion I respect has never said don't script. And then because then I see them and they're just narrating their hands the entire time. Um, and, it, and it's, it's so uninteresting. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, being a double act, just work, together all the time um, and never be afraid to never be afraid to tell the other person they're wrong or are messing up um, and then and you have to sort of leave your ego at the door like I said with that stupid that a huge big mistake with the big long number thing like that was objectively Steve's fault yeah like, that was ob objectively your fault and I came off stage and, and we and I went what the like oh mate what the fuck oh my god that was terrible and then 10 minutes later I'm not blaming it anymore because it happened you just sometimes yeah. you just have a complete you know, I mean, your brain leaves your body and you forget. Um, mm. but, but you can't hold it against him. You can't hold it against each other, you know. So, yeah, you just have to sort of move on and get on with it. Well, two, two, two more questions about being a double act. One, um, I, I, I love watching double acts. I really do. And two of my favourites that I've seen over the years is uh, Young and Strange, uh, Young and Sam Strange, uh, yep. really great guys, know them really well. And Carl and Dave, who many years before you guys were around, won the Comedy Award at the IBM two years in a row. Oh, really? um, and, and both of those acts have very, very clearly defined characters. One's a straight man. One's a really big time funny man. And I think that comes from Laurel and Hardy, Abbott and Costello. That's how Wise. Yeah. Is. yeah, exactly. I don't see that with you guys. I don't see, when I've watched you, the thing that's really fascinated me more than anything else is that you don't have those clearly, I, I look at you and I go, you're the, you're, you're the straight man. No, you're the straight, no, you're straight. It's kind of an interchangeable character. Yeah. That it's mm. kind, of, you're kind of like two guys on stage that are really funny, but there's that, I've not seen that before. Uh, at least I've never seen that before. I, I mean, think it's I, because, the, 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 oh no, go on. Yours is probably way more interesting, mate. You go for it. Oh, I doubt it. But um, I, I but uh, but also I think it, I, I think it's an important point, uh, because yeah, like when you when you're writing a double act, and we did this, one of our early conversations is like, right, what are our characters? And you know, we 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 talk very much about having the straight man, sort of funny man, uh, kind of um, dynamic. And the first script that we wrote leaned really heavily on that. And they were quite, the characters were quite combative. Like they weren't, they, they didn't, Yeah. they didn't seem to get on. Ha having a double act that has arguments and doesn't get on is such a, such a massive trope. And it's really easy to do it really badly. When you I look think, at someone. Yeah, I, I, I can't think. And I'm sure that, that oh, yeah, there's always uh, exemptions to every rule, but I can't think of a time where that really works because i think that the double act it always has to come down to the fact that they're in it together you know even if you look at some of the most combative what you know like um uh, again Morgan 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 Wise. Wise would have you know absolute screaming matches and they you know but they were awful to each other in some of their sketches but then in the following sketch they'd be getting into bed together you yeah, know same, laurel and hardy would but yeah, 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 exactly. Like uh, Rick and Aid, Rick Mann and Aid yeah, Edmondson, yeah. you know, as 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 Richie and Eddie in Bottom, they would they would beat the crap out of each other, and they were awful to each other. But you knew that they'd be lost without each other. You have to, yeah, time. you have to, yeah, you basically, you have you have to sort of uh, show a united front. You do, and and, and and for us, what we found was, we we honestly we really write 
how we act around each other. And there are times where one of us will be like one of us is the straight man, and one of us is the you know is is the funny man. You know, like um, there's just times in life. You know, what I mean, like, it's like when you're down the if you're down the down the pub with your friends or something like that. Everyone's got a st- everyone's holding court at one point and being the funny person. And you know, uh, and also it's when we when we, especially when we host and stuff. So obviously when we host, we don't actually script, script, script. We have points we will hit, but it's a bit of improv, a bit of crowd work, a bit of back and forth. But it's basic improv rules. It's yes and always. the other. You always support yes the and. other one. If Steve decides to go off script and say, and, and you know, and, and and you know, say we're in a slightly kooky venue, point something out, you know, just like oh, have you noticed up there that looks a bit like. Even if it doesn't, I'll go, yeah, it's weird. Because, and you just agree with it. You, 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 you know, it's basic improv rules. Yes, and um, just just go with the story. Keep it moving. Um, and that's just largely how we write. I mean, most most of our writing is, it's, I think it's quite common these days for people to say, oh, you start with the, you know, um, I don't like to start with the trick. Um, but I think we largely do start with the trick. We start with an idea, with, maybe not method. We start with an idea of what we want to do. Yeah. And then we sit down and then just through talking about the idea, like one of the most recent ones we did, we do a magazine tear with a TV guide. Um, and we and we had reasons for that. We had, we had reasons that made it funny. We had reasons of why it was a TV guide, why that made sense of the show. And just through sitting down with a TV guide, we wrote jokes. We, you know, that like the ridiculous uh, stuff that, that you can buy and sell in the back of a TV guide, ridiculous yeah. ads. And we wrote jokes about those. And we sat down and then we, and just through speaking, we sort of came up with a bit of a rhythm of the routine. And then the next time we meet, if we'd forgotten it all, it was probably all crap. If we remembered it, we start writing it down. Then we start coming up with methods. So we just, the fact that we've not come up with a straight man, funny man dynamic, we've had it leveled at us as... Um, as, as a, a criticism. criticism. Yeah. And, and, really? by, and by some people, and by some people who, like no, they said it, it, was, it, was a, it, it came, from a, uh, came from a good place. But some people who I respect have said that you, the characters aren't defined enough. Um, you're you're the same and, characters, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, you, you're, you're the same character on stage. It's not defined enough, um, and it hurts. And because I was like, oh, like okay, that's it's not a nice thing to. But I. Th- it's also a deliberate choice. It is a deliberate choice. It's because not our, through laziness. Yeah, no, absolutely. Our sort of our approach, and we, you know, we came about it through a reasoned decision. Was that what we want is on stage to create this this bubble of a world of an energy uh of of stupidity and idiocy you know we are the idiot magicians and we want to and we want to infect the audience with that and and bring them along for the ride and we can only do that if we present a united front of idiocy yeah. Like that's that's kind of that's sort of the philosophy, uh, for want yeah. of a better word. Behind... One of our big but one of our big buzzwords is uh, and th- like we won't like I, I won't talk about it too much because it's genuinely it's, it's in the lecture and this is not the place for it. Um, but one of our big buzzwords about e- about anything we perform is is we enthuse we are enthusiastic about everything. Like because when you yeah. think of like I guess the, I, I'll, I'll stop talking I'll stop talking about this in a second because otherwise it would just become the lecture. But our sort of view of it was, <laughs> when you think about think about the greats, you know, like like think about Juan Tamariz. Juan Tamariz is a man who is ridiculously over enthusiastic about stupid card tricks. He's a genius. He's an absolute genius. Oh. Because, you know his slights and everything, blah blah blah, and his you know his 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 thoughts on things are genius. But to an audience, he is just this. He's this little old bloke who is ridiculously enthusiastic about stupid card tricks. And what that does is it brings you in. It makes you go, oh, it must be good. Because look how excited he is. It's contagious. And that, yeah. And that's what we do. We come out on stage. We're always just, you know, we're, we're, we're big postures. We're big gestures. We we laugh at our own jokes. I Like, like I like I laugh at every, like, I laugh at the same jokes that Steve just told on stage. We, laugh. we enjoy ourselves. We always look like we're having a good time. Because because then they just go, well, it must be all right because they look like they're having a good time. It's it's a cheap trick basically, but they we just we always look like we're enjoying ourselves, and they go, they must be all right because two of them up there they're enjoying it. Um, that's amazing. That I wow, yeah, I can see that. I can see that. 
you're absolutely correct. Yeah, I, uh, that's that, the, Juan Tamarici's style. That's the whole Spanish style, isn't it? When you think about it, yeah. that yeah, it's like the, Danny De Ortiz does the same thing, doesn't he? You know, it's that it's that childlike excitement for the magic he's performing, and God, that's what it should be. Yeah. You know, you you don't want to be too prescriptive about what magic should be, but we're we're big fans of you know just. Uh, leading by example for your audience. Yeah, you know. look, look like you enjoy it. Really. <laughs> Just like because it, because people, you, you never want to get people's back up with magic. You know what I mean? It, it, you never want like we we are the most uncombative performers. It works for some people. It's not our thing. Um, we just we so when we go out there, we give the impression that like it's like no, you really should be excited about this. This is a kind of you know this is. And occasionally we sort of break. Basically, our, the joke we always have is we will drag an audience down to our level. Um, and then the moment they get down there, we then reprimand them for letting us do it. So we will, <laughs> we will, tell, we will tell stupid jokes until we get a big laugh. And then the moment you get a big laugh for a really stupid joke, you turn Judge them, them a little bit for you turn them. them yeah. you're, like, you're like, like, come on, grow up. Um, <laughs> and, and then you bring them down again. But it's because it's they they know we're just being stupid, so you can get away with doing it. That's fantastic. And I have one other question <clears throat> about double acts. Mm. Obviously, probably the most well known, probably the most famous double act in magic is Penn and Teller. Yep. Mm -hmm. And Penn and Teller famously have both said on record several times that the way that they have stayed as a double act for what a thousand years or however long Teller's been alive now. Give or take, yeah. Um, yeah, something like that. Is that they they're not really friends outside of the show. Like mm. they literally just do the show when they're when they're doing the show or they're planning the show or they're structuring the show. But any time that that's not they're not friends. They never meet socially. Yeah, they never have true. I mean, they, they they very they very publicly said that, haven't they? Uh, yeah, but the thing is, true, when you when... It's the narrative they've held for probably. Yeah. Again, you know, I think but, it's but the, also if you're yeah. doing eight shows a week or whatever it is with someone, then you're spending half your time with that person anyway. So yeah. I you know if you know if that was the case, I don't think I'd want to then have dinner with you after the yeah. show. Like do, do you know what I mean? Because not just the it, two of it, you know, we'd go out as a group kind of thing, you know, but you I mean, be, sure, yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah, but, if we would if we were doing if we were doing every you know which again you know in, in festivals and stuff like that you know when we do edinburgh fringe we spend so much time in each we're together like 20 hours a day kind of thing yeah, yeah. and and again that's a good example of you do drive you drive each other mad oh right? yeah but again oh, we, we, that... we lose our rag with each other at least twice a fringe you know where we just oh, yeah. we're just done with each other yeah, there was, there was, you get there... back on up on stage and you do the show and you have a great time and you go oh yeah that's why i do it yeah We've. We, uh, I remember the first year. It's one of my favourite memories. Um, oh, we did the fringe, and we were. It was mid fringe, and Steve was trying to get something like an email sent or some kind of poster up online. And I was like, "Yeah, but we have a show in ten minutes. We need to leave the flat." And Steve was going, oh, "I need to get it done." And I was like, "No, no, but we have a show. We need to leave the flat." And Steve goes, "Well, no one's going to know about the show." Let's, we had this big blazing argument. I got so angry, I stormed out the front door. But I was so angry, I actually it wasn't stormed the into front the door. I stormed into the electrical cupboard by mistake. <laughs> and I stood in there for ten in minutes. The student hall's flat that we're staying wow. in. <laughs> And then it becomes minutes. a game of chicken of who's going to acknowledge this first. And you, ca thing. you can't stay angry in that situation. Oh. But yeah, we have, we, we, again, we don't have blazing arguments, but we have, we definitely have shirty moments with each other. But you spend so much time together. Of course you are. Of course you are. But you, but you know it doesn't matter. And also, yeah. we, and also we we've are, got very good at just, even when we're together, just largely ignoring each other. We, we will sit in silence for hours. If, yeah, if, you know, happily. If, if we've got like a you know if we've got an afternoon show and a late evening show and we have to stay at the venue, we we'll, we will sit backstage on our phones. Or if we're being flown out for a you know a cruise ship contract or whatever, got you know a twelve hours of travelling or whatever, then yeah, we're not we're, we're not we're not this the whole time. That would no, that no, would no. drive everyone mad. Um, um, but again, it's but that thing of you're in it for the right reasons, and it helps that we were we were good mates before we started doing this. And we and I, largely think only I think you have to start in that place of 
of having genuine chemistry and genuinely just enjoying each other's company and humor and what have you. And yeah, obviously over time, again, it's that old married couple thing, you know, some of it starts to grate and get a bit old, but ultimately we, we love what we do yeah. and that's what keeps it ticking over. And we have so many different kinds of shows and we're always working on something. So it kind of keeps yeah. the spark, you know, because, you know, we do like, for example, the show we do on the ships hasn't checked. That's just bankable bang pub set material that we can do backwards in French. You know, it's it's we don't have to think about that too much. Um, but that's why it's good for us that we always have we always have a project on the go. We're always write, writing with a deadline for something. Uh, it used to be fringe, but we've got other stuff coming up this year that we're writing for. Um, and it just it, it means that there'll, there'll always be one of us that will suddenly send a photo or a video to the other one on WhatsApp and just be like, what do you think of this? How about this? This is a good idea. And then the other one will either send back. Absolutely. You know, again, and that's yeah. just a thing. Like just what, what one of us in, in the kitchen, you know, just with like props that we've just mocked up out of cardboard going, look, this isn't it, but yeah. just go with and yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, we've 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 got phones full of those god awful videos that yeah. you know w no one would ever ever get to see, and neither should they. But some of those have become the germ that has become, yeah. you know, sort of some of our biggest routines and stuff yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. Or, you know, the the finale of the next show or whatever. Wow, I remember yeah. it, and this this won't this won't uh, tip too much. I remember you. I just uh, I um I sent you a voice note last year. And just uh, and just shouted, it rattles, it rattles, <laughs> and then that was I was like so excited, and, yeah, and that's all you said. Needed. All it needed to say. That was out of context. We hadn't spoken that day, and I just sent you a voice note shouting, it rattles. <laughs> that's hilarious. That's so funny. Look, I'm going to ask you one last question. This has been a really fascinating interview, and I've loved finding out more about you guys. And you deserve every single second of success that you've had. Oh, and I want to ask you one more question. What do you have? What? No, I know that you will have. What goals do you have moving forward over the next coming five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years? What bucket list items do you want to hit in entertainment and in magic? Do you have anything on your magical bucket list that you're wanting to achieve? We've talked about you kind of dipping your toe into the magic community and wanting to do more with that. You've alluded to something that's happening that, is replacing the fringe this year and i know that's you know the fringe is a big deal to you so you've obviously got other stuff coming up but what what goals and aspirations and and and, and things do you want to hit um that you haven't hit yet what well, i think the inside things... and outside of magic is different things yeah oh yeah totally uh with it within what we do uh with it within the magic act um one thing that we definitely really like to be doing is just touring our show around the UK, just booking out some art centers and theaters and really getting into that side of it. Cause we've not done a whole lot of that. No, you know, we've done... obviously we do fringe, which is that, but we've, we've not done a whole lot of that outside of fringe. Mm. Um, so we'd like to be able to get that as a bit of a rolling, uh, kind of interest just throughout the calendar year. Yeah, just a bit more kind of a, you know, a, like, you know, a good ha handful of dates in different cities every month, yeah. as opposed to, you know, you, we, you know, we do, you know, shows here, there and everywhere. Oh, where yeah, some, yeah, yeah. Where somewhere just an art centre will contact you and say, oh, I saw you at the Fringe, you want to come do one here? And we'll say, of course. But it, it, they, they never sort of, there's no, not sort of a real tour momentum going on there. Hmm. Um, uh, but yeah, we, you know, we, we are just looking to, We've always said that all we want to do is do the show. We just want to do the show. We want to, you know, we, we have... Do the show all, for nice audiences. Yeah, and... we, we have like four hours worth of stage shows that we are happy with. Um, and so, you know, putting together a good night, putting together a, you know, solid 90 minutes um, for for touring, um, we love doing. And we get, again, we get the chance to do it, just not as often as we would like at the yes. moment. Uh, and it's because only in the last couple of years we've really started getting into ships. Um, so we do, so this uh, this year we've got like another fifteen weeks spread out uh, on ships, and we love it. We absolutely love it. Great. But that, but to, you know, in the last couple of years the focus was okay. This is really good. Let's let's hit the ships really hard whilst the going's good, 
Um, and although we have no plans to leave the ships, we really enjoy doing it. Um, we're now looking at the next thing, which is potentially getting up and touring and stuff like that. Um, within the magic community, the things we want to do, um, we've got a book. Um, we've got a book in us. In the works. Yeah. Um, so we yeah we started with writing the lecture notes and suddenly realized that we could have kept going and yeah. so we will so, so yeah we've got we've got yeah we've, we've got definitely got the startings of a book um and again we're look we've Amazing. got a few more few more lecture things booked in uh, again blackpool i'm gonna go i was gonna say really. like to do some of the bigger conventions blackpool the session uh yeah, I stuff to, like, like that I need to uh, I need to message Russ Stevens and make sure he doesn't think we're Morgan and West again. <laughs> <laughs> did, did you say he watches this? Yeah, Russ, Russ Stevens and Russ Brown and Guy Barrett all watch the uh, Magic That's, TV. Then I'm sure Russ Stevens won't mind me saying it because it's been years years have passed, and I say this I say this with affection. Uh, we spoke to him for 45 minutes on the phone once um, about uh, doing a certain television program, and we were we were very close to doing it and then he said i have to ask do you always do the victorian time traveling thing or do you do other characters <laughs> and at that point our souls left our body <laughs> wow well i was gonna say that i was gonna say you guys are so unique and funny and different would you ever consider doing britain's got talent or america's got talent or never say never yeah i mean it, uh, it's such a difficult one, isn't it? You know, um, Britain's Got Talent doesn't have the best reputation necessarily. You know, they could they can make or break you uh, seemingly on a whim, uh, which makes me very uncomfortable. Um, America's Got Talent seems to have a better better reputation for that. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Never say never. It's not it's not on our hot list at the moment. No, but if, no if, not... we, if we felt it was right for us, maybe. And that's the thing, like so, like so many people, obviously Ryland, like obviously Ryland, so many people have done so well. Oh yeah, that it's very, it, it's it's you know, I think anybody would be lying if they said they didn't want that. But I don't think it is always that. And also, I'm not a hundred percent sure. I'm not a hundred percent sure we would. We don't fit that bracket of. What, what I think they want from magic at this point, which is fine. It's important. I think it's important to know when you're not right for something, you know, in, in the, for the same reason we're not, you know, for the same reason we don't audition to be magicians in the national ballet. You know what I mean? Like we're not right for that. If that was a role that was there and I'm not, sh I'm just not sure we're potentially right for. I think a lot we do is just too long form for something mm. like Britain's Got Talent. We can't go out in three minutes and represent ourselves. Well, we can, but we won't have got to any tricks. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know. I said that I've just I, like we we yeah we've just applied for a couple of different uh, uh different TV things that did appeal to us. Yeah. Um, again, whether anything will come of that, I'm not I'm not doing a I'm not doing a magician thing of going things in the pipeline. No. Nothing in the pipeline. There is nothing in the pipeline. Um, but who I, knows? Well, you never know. Something might come of it. Um, but but yeah, again, so we we'd like to release we'd like to release uh, a book because I I think I think. There were some interesting things that we would like We've to We've also say. potentially got a couple of standalone releases for the magic community, sort of expansions on some of our yeah our kind of um, longer lasting, heavier hitting routines that we think might be of interest to magicians wow. in general. Um, but but yeah, we like I said, we've so we because we've written this, you know, we have we have our lecture at the moment, homemade miracles, um, which we've been lucky enough to do at some lovely conventions and some lovely places. We've down I think smoke and mirrors next week. Doing it for Mark Bennett, um, and um, and yeah, people seem to enjoy it because it's about it's about performance and it's about putting stuff on stage. And I don't think there's a lot of magic lectures that are just about going right. Here is how you put stuff on stage. Um, uh, so yeah, it would be like I said, it'd be really nice to do some of the big conventions because we'd often joked about the fact that we won't go to Blackpool until they book us, and then that became that joke became a solid. We're maybe never we'll going to Blackpool. Maybe we'll never go to Blackpool. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, which is stupid. It's just stupid. That's just our, our silly little joke. That's not on them. That's hilarious, man. I, I, you've done so much. You really have. And I, I, having spent a bit of time with you, I'm, I'm blown away. I genuinely, genuinely am blown away. And you've achieved so much success. Like honestly, there's just the fact that you make your living from magic is just incredible enough. 
But I love the fact that you kind of go, right, I'm going to make the Edinburgh Fringe work for us. And you do. Hey, OK, we're going to get more work. And you do. And you're doing cruises and you're doing this and you're doing that. Hey, we're going to dip our toe into the magic community. And now you're, you know, you're winning competitions. You're, 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 you're lecturing and you're performing at gala shows. Now you're releasing books and you're releasing tricks. And it's just like, it's amazing, you know, what you guys, you say you're not business people, but you seem to be doing. But the, the best thing is all, it's all well. the work. It's yeah, just, yeah. We, just we, we, we can the create work. the product, but it's yeah. selling it that's uh, and you know making it financially viable. That's where we fall down. I'm sure. I'm sure <laughs> we'll end up with a garage full of books because we forget to tell people <laughs> we printed them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll we'll, we'll forget to actually publicize it or sell Ooh. it or you know whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because oh, that's yeah. who we are. We are the people that we. You know, like it's like silly little things. I was talking to. Um, Talking to our friend uh, Dave, do you know Dave Anik, magician? Yes. Um, uh, so we talk, I was talking to Dave Anik. Uh, we do a lot of venue sharing and fringe with him. We're, uh, we're pretty close. And um, he was talking. He does a lot of horror theme stuff, and we do a lot of horror theme stuff. We do some seance work and blah blah blah. And again, to put into perspective just how much we don't tell people, he was talking about an idea, and then I sent him a video. So he was like, "Why have you never told me you did this?" And I went, "Oh, we forgot." We forgot. <laughs> And he was like, he was like, honestly, like it was a, it was just a silly little routine we put together for a Halloween show. And then Dave was like, I will pay you to have that. I will pay you a lot of money to have that. And I'm like, nah, no, nah, it's ours, no, nah, it's ours. Um, <laughs> because we just forget, we forget that we again we have three Halloween shows that we've written, three different Halloween shows, and we just and another just one write. in the pipeline. Yeah. yeah, we've got another one in the pipeline. Yeah, because just because we enjoy them, and we just yeah, we just do it. If people want to enjoy. Yeah, if people if people prod us enough, we'll tell them we have them. Would you ever go down the route of doing kids shows or family shows? Like, there's a lot. Of, like, you you talked about Morgan and West. I mean, they do. They smash it. Oh, yeah, they're the, the, great they, at that stuff. So yeah, they, they tour the UK yeah. doing kids shows on top of what they do as. Yeah. You know. To be actually funny, we were talking about this on Sunday in Bournemouth. Uh, yeah. Just how it's just not for us. We've done a couple when when we've been asked to. Sort of friends of friends. Yeah. Um, and we uh, always but, do it and we come away and we go, yeah, no. we got a, we got away with it, but mm. it's not, it's, it's just not us. Like we, we, we like to make adults feel like kids when they watch our show. That that's kind of our aim for that. Kids are already there. They've already done that bit. <laughs> it's we're, we're out of a job with them, you know? It's, yeah. And it's just, it's just such a, I think it's just such a different skill set. I mean, I think Morgan and West are really good at it mainly because they're just very, very good performers who put a hell of a lot of work into what they do. They used to be teachers, so they'd have had to talk to children. Um, neither of us have kids. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so we don't, we, we, we're not at a point where we're fully familiar with how to properly interact with kids. And I've got a mouth on me like a sewer. So it's, <laughs> like, that's really difficult. Yeah. Like, we do family-friendly shows. Like, we also, we do a lot of um, work for English heritage. You know, when you go to, like, castles on bank holidays and there's people dressed up as jesters and doing shows and stuff so we do we do old-fashioned magic shows stuff. for english yeah, heritage yeah. Um, and those are all family shows and that's fine because it's it's mum dad and kids great jobs are good and all, everyone sit on the floor and pick the pick their blankets you'll get a 20-minute show if it's just kids nah nah uh, yeah 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 well, it, again, it comes back to what you were saying before, which is know what you want to do. You know, you guys are in this, not just to make money, but also for the fun of it. And you love performing. Mm. So why would you put yourself through something that you don't particularly enjoy that much? A little bit like... That's it. like I, I get that, you know, um, it, it can be a great living. You know, I've, you know, I, I, I know kids entertainers and kids performers who do very well. You know, they're constantly working. They make a very nice income from it. You love uh, it, don't you, Craig? You do a lot. You're like... Like, I love doing kids shows. Oh, yeah, you, I've, you, I've you've been. got a whole mini industry underneath you of uh, of kid entertainers, absolutely, and it's amazing. But it's just, yeah, it's not. It's, you it's, have to again. It's, you have it's, to know it's not our not area of expertise. You know when it's not yours. Yeah. And one other question, I like, I, I, of course, I keep thinking, I keep saying it's the last question, but I keep thinking. <laughs> like, yeah. Sorry, we I'm keep so talking. Sorry. We're awful. Fascinating. Um, one last question. Um, I see a lot of double acts and what they do. Even if they don't start that way, they kind of gravitate towards it. They start putting bigger stuff in their show. 
Like you look at a lot of the double acts and and they've got illusions in their show, like I did with Slightly Unusual. We worked with Jay and Josh over the weekend and they've got like flamethrowers and lasers and and yeah. God knows what. And, you know, you, you look at Young and Strange and, and there's so many double acts that have the big stuff because I think it makes it easier to be a double act when you've got all of those props on stage, maybe. Um, or at least it did with me. That was one of the reasons I did it. But like, do you, do, do, do have you ever been, your show is very much, Out I don't of the case. it's not about the magic, but it is, it's very magical, yeah. but you don't hiding behind big props. You don't need the big no. props in your show. Have you, was that a conscious decision? And have you ever kind of gone, you know what, let's Vegas it up or, or is it? We've talked a couple of times about getting some bigger things into the show. Um, but for one thing, I think we'd struggle to make them fit the dynamic of what we do and how we do things, you know, kind of like you say, all of our material is it's us first. Mm. Um, and sort of the, the, the magic comes along with that. And I think that we would struggle to do that with big props and illusions. Mm. The other also, thing is we're quite lazy in terms of just bringing stuff to gigs. Like if we're putting a show together and it doesn't all fit in the suitcase, we go, oh, oh, why can't we just be like mentalists or hypnotists or something? Like, why, why have I got to carry two things to this venue? Yeah, it was, it was uh, um, uh, Mark James said to me once, he, like we were walking around the dealers hall, I think, and Mark James went, oh, that looks nice, but that's another trip to the car. No, no, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. And um and yeah, and the thing, and also like, uh, I think, again, it, we might be making excuses for ourselves here, but we're aesthetic, aesthetically, that's the word, isn't it? Um, yeah, that's a word. Yeah. Um, Depends so, what you're trying to say, but it's a word. <laughs> vi visually. visually. Ah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, we we like our sort of our sort of get up, the way we dress, and the way where we are on stages. We like the audience to think that maybe we've only just arrived in town. We've opened the case. We've done the show. And then we could be gone again in a heartbeat. And we, we won't be seen for dust and we'll rock up in our yeah. town down the road and be doing the same thing again on the same night. Yeah. It's a bit medicine show. You know, we wear we wear striped shirts and bow ties. Um it's you know, it's it's not it's not it's not specifically deliberately vintage and old fashioned, but it's just a bit timeless. We're just trying to look a bit kind of again, just as these kind of people that have just rolled into town. Harkening back to sort of carnies and yeah, medicine men and hustlers and so it's all gotta come out of the you know, everything we make is it got it looks like it's made of cardboard and it's well, all written on it. Is. Pen. Yeah. Um and yeah, we if we got something printed, we'd have to then roll it around in the dirt to make it look horrible. Um, it's just deliberate. We want to look at, look like we don't know what we're doing and we don't really, we shouldn't really be there. So, yeah. That's, and so, yeah, yeah, coming out with a big shiny jaws of death or whatever, just, yeah, it, do, it doesn't, it doesn't fit that aesthetic. Yeah. We, uh, and we can't afford it. No, we do own a sub trunk, but it still lives uh, in Dave's. <laughs> we never cabin. picked it up. No. <laughs> <laughs> We Which bought, is just us in a nutshell. We again, bought it off someone and never collected it. Terrible businessmen. We spent hundreds of pounds on a sub trunk and it lives in Chester. And I've never been and to we Chester. we don't. No. <laughs> You're closer, Craig. Can you pick up a sub trunk? I'll, I'll never get one. I'm there next week, actually. You just let me know where it is. Th thing is, though, we'll never get it off you. No. <laughs> So if you want a sub trunk, <laughs> <laughs> Craig got a sub trunk. Come on. <laughs> well, the IBM convention this year is in North Wales, and in order for you guys to get to North Wales, you've got to go up the M6, past Chester. So... Past it, exactly. Past it. Oh right, okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, do you know what the stupid thing is? We we did we did three nights in Chester last Halloween and didn't even think about it. Yeah, didn't even occur to us. I, like, I, I want to point out, like, this isn't some kind of made-up anecdote. This is a thing that exists, but it perfectly encapsulates how stupid we are. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, look, I don't think you're stupid, but the bottom line is, like I said, you're very successful. Um, you know, Luckily, the show's all right. Yeah. <laughs> it, <laughs> we hey, get away it, with it, yeah. It uh, comes back to what we said at the very beginning, which is be so good that they can't ignore you. And you guys are very good. Oh, and very few people are ignoring you. A lot of people are talking about you. There's a big buzz about you. I was at the uh, the Wessex convention, and everybody 
Um, I, I went out for the Indian the meal the night before, oh, and yeah. you weren't there, and everybody was like, oh, "I'm so excited! Griffin, uh, Griffin and Jones are going to be there. Oh, oh, really nice. excited. I can't wait to see them." So th there's a lot of buzz about you guys, and I think it's because a lot of people haven't seen you, and they want to see you, and they've heard about you. It's Chinese whispers. It's it's kind of uh, uh, you know picking up momentum, and I think that's that's something that you can't. That's what aiming for. Yeah, yeah. that's amazing. That's so, the game. There are a lot of people that book lectures. There are a lot of people that hold conventions. And there are a lot of people uh, that hold big conventions that watch Magic TV. Just drop Stop. us an email. We're probably okay. free. How can they get hold of you? Available at suspiciously short notice. Absolutely. Our availability is second to none. Um, yeah, yeah if, we're not, if we're not on a ship at the time, uh, just drop us an email, info at griffinandjones.co.uk. Um, um, that's, that's and we'll ignore one. it because we're terrible business people. Uh, yes, so, someone will pick it up somewhere down the line. Uh, email, we're, we're, we're on all the social media media media. as well, so yeah. No, just... uh, that, that's a lie. We're very good at responding to emails. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, if, like, if email you... us. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram. Um, just yeah, drop drop us a message somewhere, and we'll we'll make it happen. That's amazing. And are you going to be at any conventions the rest of the year? Or, I mean, are you? Uh, I'm trying to think what we've got. I don't think uh, we've got anything booked in at the moment. But no, I mean, the, the, yeah, we've got, we've got, we've got the availability. Few, well, yeah, we've got we've got a few lectures booked. I'm looking at my calendar now. Yeah, we've got, we've a few got a lectures couple, yeah. booked in. Uh, but I don't think any specific conventions. Again, no, I am. They're, they're club lectures at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I keep I keep joking, but I am genuinely probably this week going to attack um, the Russes. Um, about Blackpool in the hope that I can schmooze the, something out of them. Okay, um, so we won't be doing Blackpool? No, no, so, we'll never, <laughs> so, you, so, you, so you won't see us at Blackpool. <laughs> you guys should speak to Russ Brown about working the House of Secrets. Mm. Love to do that. Absolutely and, love to do that. Well, I will speak to Russ for you. I oh, bless you. Thank you, mate. Oh. You guys, okay, and then off the back of that, he can get you in for a lecture to the Blackpool Magic Convention, and then that's exactly. normally it's like the Blackpool Magic Club, and that's normally the gateway to get into the convention. So, gotcha. Oh, yeah. there we go. We're getting all the inside knowledge, mate. Take this yeah. down. Take See, it's all down. about who you know, isn't it? Yeah. Who do we know? Um, <laughs> I'll connect you guys, no problem. <laughs> Russ would love you. I don't know how well you know Russ Brown, but you're no. his sort of people. He would oh, love great. you. He really would. So, I've got uh, a fellow idiot, then that's what we like. <laughs> that's what we're in the market for, yeah absolutely guys thank you so much for jumping on the channel oh, thank you, you. Oh, thank you what a delight really appreciate it and i want everyone that's watching this interview to uh, uh follow you uh if you know anyone that's organizing a, a club lecture or a convention make sure that you uh, you get that person to send an email through to uh uh, through to Nathan and Steve, let because you guys are amazing, and it's about time that you stop being the best kept secret in magic, and you start being, you know, something that everybody knows about. Because you are good for magic, you know, you do good magic, you're entertaining, and and I just know you guys are going to blow up even more than you have. Oh, thank so, you very much, mate. It's very thank kind. I appreciate it. True. Thank you so much for coming on the channel. Guys, Pleasure. leave a comment down below. Uh, let Stephen and Nathan know what you thought of the uh, the lecture. If you see them advertised anywhere, go and see them because their show is bloody amazing. And follow them on social media. And yeah, guys, one more time. Thank you so much for jumping on the channel. Thank you. Really. Thanks, Greg. And uh, I will see you again soon uh, on another Magic TV. So on behalf of... Uh, on behalf of Griffin and Jones, Nathan Jones and Steve Griffin, we'll see you again soon. Bye. Cheers.